Uh, welcome to the next episode of the LIT show. The LIT show is a program organized by Dr. Rao's Center for Reproductive Immunology, and it involves an interaction with eminent experts in the field of gynecology, infertility, and IVF, and also patients. The purpose of the program is to share the experiences of these experts in reproductive immunology and of patients who have benefited from reproductive immunology. Today we have a very very eminent expert in the in this field of IVF and reproductive immunology. Uh, let me welcome Dr. George Endukwe from London. Welcome Dr. George. Well, thank you very much for for having me. Uh, it's a it's a great pleasure to be in in uh, in your lead show. Dr. George is one of the most experienced fertility experts in Europe, and is a world leader in the investigation and treatment of recurrent IVF failures. He began his long career career in the field as a research fellow at the Royal Free Hospital London in 1984. under professor shaw after working as a medical director at the prestigious reproductive medicine unit at nottingham university dr george joined care fertility nottingham as its medical director before becoming the founder medical director of the zeta west clinic team in 2011 he has recently been awarded the uh, uh, fellowship uh, in clinical reproductive immunology by the american society for reproductive immunology and that's a uh, really really big honor and we are really honored to have such an esteemed uh, guest here on our lit show who has been called as the miracle baby maker by various people so welcome dr george and uh, the first thing that comes to our mind we always uh, when we talk about you is what brought you to the field of infertility it's and very how interesting. Did, how did you uh, start uh, developed interest in the field of infertility very interesting my in- initial interest wasn't reproductive medicine at all my you know my early uh, love was fetal medicine so i was training uh, in fetal medicine at queen charlotte hospital and uh you know when you're a junior doctor not not you don't have a lot of, a lot of money so i went to the royal free hospital to do a locum i got there um and um they were doing egg collections through the laparoscopy meanwhile i could shall us we could do intrauterine blood transfusion under ultrasound guidance with static scanners so i told the professor there why are you guys doing this you know if you can do in tritrium blood transfusion in the womb with a baby there caught dangling all over the place the ovaries are not moving the follicles are big sitting still i said why don't you just use ultrasound guidance to just put in it like get the eggs out he fell over he laughed so much and asked me what do you know about ivf i knew absolutely nothing about ivf i wasn't even interested in ivf So well, we laughed, and then uh, you know I w- went back to Queen Charlotte's, and then uh, I was invited as a research fellow. He he called me and invited me to to join him as a research fellow. I thought that's strange. Nobody offered you jobs in in those days. Every job interview there about six eight people. So I told my professor, I'm not sure. Maybe I'm not sure about this. He called Professor Shaw. He said, No, no, you got a job. So I went there for the job. He said, "Okay, you've been talking about ultrasound guided egg collection. Now you do it." Oh my goodness! I didn't know where to start. But luckily, somebody else, an Austrian called Dallenbach, was able to do it and and describe it and publish it. So I lost my ability, my opportunity to be the first to do it. And then, of course, uh, as, as a research fellow. Bisarolin um uh, the, the gene arch agonist was new nobody knew what to do with it so professor show had somebody looking at it can it be used for for fibroids can it be used for endometriosis my brief was can it be used for ivf so we did some research in in that where i designed a pump and um, you know I, i put a small needle under the skin a belt the the, the, the women wore the belt and it gave them pulses 
of uh, of uh, of Bucero League every 90 minutes. I had to sit down and take blood every five minutes for eight hours every time. Anyway, when we finished that, we wrote it up and sent it to Lancet. It was published within three months. Wow, I thought, my goodness, maybe this is my own specialty. Maybe this is made for me. Your, your first ever research published in Lancet in record time. I said, I can live with this. That's how my interest in uh, in the uh, in IVF uh, and, and infertility came about. So it's been going on ever since. Then, uh, been at the right place at the right time. In those days, then you just, uh, if you, sperm count was low, it was a sperm donation. And then my colleague, uh, 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 Professor uh, Simon Fischel, um, was experimenting the group procedure of ICSI was being formed. In those days, you to just inject five sperm under the coat of the egg. Ultimately, anyway, it became ICSI. And um, that's when I joined the Nurture, the, 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 the Nurture University IVF uh, uh, Clinic, Research and Treatment Center. And uh, so it was nice to be part of development as things were moving forward. Then ultimately, then we could do everything. If you know, if you have no sperm, we can aspirate it and do ICSI. I thought, my God, that's nothing we couldn't do. But results remained the same. Pregnancy rates never went as high as it should be. That's when I met the late Professor Alan Beer. He was doing so much work on the productive immunology, which I was so, I was interested in it, but I was completely baffled by it. I didn't understand it at all. I used to pick his paper, read 10 lines, and I was so confused. I thought, my God, I can't believe I had I couldn't understand it. And then I invited him. We're having the British Fertility Society meeting, uh, annual conference in Nottingham. I invited him as a guest speaker, where he came and talked about productive immunology and the rest of it. And um, so that's how we established a relationship. They invited me over, spent some time with him in Chicago. And what I saw there, that's when I was absolutely 100% convinced. We saw women with so many failed cycles, so many miscarriages. You know, they were getting pregnant, they were having babies. You could scan them, you could see it. No, but there was no guesswork at all in it. So I thought, you know, there must be something in reproductive immunology. We were using IVIG, lit uh, treatment. And I thought, my, I, better, I better learn this now. <laughs> So, uh, Dr. George, uh, Dr. George, what was your experience in Nottingham? How was your experience in Nottingham before you shifted to either care fertility at the same time or? Uh? No, no, no. In, in, in Nottingham, you know, we developed ICSI pr pr procedure. There was a time in the UK, if you needed ICSI, you had to come to the IVF clinic in Nottingham. And uh, we developed new techniques and all that. But the immunology part of it, the recurrent failure part of it, was when I invited uh, Professor Beer to Nottingham. He spent some time there, and I went to see him, and we developed, uh, we started to work together. The plan was, okay, let's have established reproductive immunology in the UK, and the, the arrangement between CARE, my IVF clinic, and the University of Chicago was to maybe every three or four months, he will come to Nottingham, run clinics, and then maybe once or twice a year, I'll go to Chicago and do something. So, so, what, was, so what was your experience with uh, uh, Dr. Beer? The, the, you know, the, the most intelligent doctor I've ever met in my life. People, I'd, it, was, it was like Marmite. That you don't, people don't have, uh, you don't like him or you hate him. It was, it was quite arrogant. But then intelligent people quite often quite arrogant, you know. He couldn't understand why people didn't understand what he was saying. So he lost his patience. I had to tell him, please, just, you know, it's hard to understand. Can you explain it to them carefully? He just thinks they should understand this. He was, uh, so that's how we started. So I, I, I got him uh, um, to be registered in the UK so he could practice. So he started working with me in Nottingham, but he wanted to also establish something in London, I linked him up with my friend, 
uh, at AIGC, Taranisi. Uh, so you know, they studied one in London and then obviously one in uh, one in uh, in Nottingham. And in those days, uh, we, you know, we did our investigations. He came around clinics with me and then went back. So it was a, 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 a collaboration. And then uh, his assistant at the time, who is now in charge, uh, uh, Jonah Kwakim, uh, we all worked together and developed uh, things. And um, so my experience with Alan Beer in Nottingham University was that he was able to bring in that knowledge, that body of knowledge, which didn't exist in the UK, was able to bring it into the UK and establish it. And, um, and the rest is history because um, we practiced it and the results were excellent results. Because, you know, you know, as I know, that the outcome measure is a live birth. All right. You cannot make it up. So, you know, people, as you know, there are a lot of, we argue about this all the time. But luckily for us, the outcome measure is a live birth. So whether people agree with you and I or not, people are having babies. People that are having miscarriages, you are helping them have babies. People that have recurrent IVF failures, we're helping them to have babies. And that is incontrovertible. That is the fact. So whether people understand the immunology or not, the fact is that it is helping people have babies. So I think is the, the, the doctors should open their minds and you know try and get involved and learn to do it to help women. Otherwise, there'll be a lot of people who need help who are simply not getting the help. That's why your center is such a wonderful thing to have uh, because women, has people, couples, at least know that there's something that can still be done for them. So what do you think about uh, reproductive immunology in uh, IV failures or miscarriages? Is its role, is it important? And what, what would you say about it? Anybody who says it's not important must be must be mistaken. But you know, in other debates I've had, I'll try to put it in context. The most important thing when it comes to failures and miscarriages still remains if in the chromosome abnormality in the embryos. That is responsible for quite a large number uh, of them. But in my opinion, some of the work we did show that 20-25 percent of women then have normal babies, but are still miscarrying the babies. You know, they do all the tests, they say there's nothing wrong with you. But then why are you having miscarriages? There's, if, there's, if there's nothing wrong with you. Uh, I'll give you an example. A lady, when I, when I was in Nottingham, um, went to a big recurrent miscarriage clinic in London, a big professor, my friend, but we don't agree on many things had five miscarriages. When she had the fifth one, professor, this professor told her, oh, it's all in your head. This woman is CEO of a big company in the in Canadian Wharf in London, very intelligent woman. He, she went completely mad. I'm coming to your clinic. I'm having miscarriages. Then all of a sudden, you tell me it's in my head, no. I am having miscarriages. So she said, well, I think I want to see Dr. George in, uh, in Nottingham. He thought it was nonsense, it was rubbish. There's no point going there. She came, landed there at my doorstep. So I told her, well, you know, you know, you came from this clinic, you know, they've told you everything about reproductive immunology. I don't agree with them. If you want me to treat you, you must do my tests. I want to know why I'm scaring and not just try this, try that. He said, well, that's why we're here. So we did all the tests, we did natural cell assay, HLA DQ alpha, we did all the, all, the, all the tests and found that she needed IVIG uh, and, and, or intralipids. So she came through, we treated her, she got pregnant. So I told her, please, go to that professor in London and book your antenatal care under her. Because I want her to know that you're pregnant. 
I wanted to know that you're also going to have the baby as well. So she went there, booked, had the baby there. And, um, and um, you know, the funny thing was that when she went to visit her and they're thinking about what to do, she would say, hang on a second, let's call Dr. George. She would call me from her clinic. She didn't like it at all. But anyway, she had a baby. So after that, her tone softened a little bit in the criticisms because she has a baby. Then she went to the newspaper and t- told her story. They contacted me, said, can I comment on this? I said, I can't unless she gives permission. She said, no, 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 please go ahead. You know, it just brought sheets in London, I think the Daily Telegraph. A big picture with the couple and their baby. And they, they obviously they had to, to interview the professor. They, 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 they interviewed me. And professor said, oh, there's no evidence. I had about 80 texts and emails saying, no evidence. But that's the evidence. The baby is there. What are, what are they talking about? <laughs> that's the evidence. That's the man, the baby. That is the evidence. What, what, what else do you want as, as evidence? So, you know, it, it is, uh, it is um, uh, a difficult, it's something that we, 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 you and I, we know the benefits, but still there's a lot of struggling to convince majority of our colleagues that there is so much value in this. You can't just keep having, you know, um, uh, miscarriages or IVF failures and people keep telling you it's nothing, it's chance, is there's no, there must be a reason why you're having failed cycles. There must be a reason why you're having miscarriages. If you find out the reason and treat it, you get pregnant, have a baby successfully. I think it is your famous dialogue that when a, pay, a woman comes to you for IVF, you ask, do you want to do IVF or you want to have a baby? Well, so exactly. it is, it's extremely exactly. important from... Well, well, uh, Yes, yes, you hit the nail on the head. People come in and I tell them, please, don't tell me you're coming to have IVF. I said, said like, but uh, you have IVF clinic. I said, no, 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 no. Just tell me that you, you want to have a baby. Because IVF is only a part of the process. It is not the process. You know, whenever anybody, any doctor comes to work yes. with me, the first thing I do is to get into their heads and try and change the way they're thinking about it. People are not just having IVF. People want a baby. That yeah. means you do IVF, you do whatever else. If you need immunology, <laughs> modulation, you do it. There are so many other things. We do holistic approach, uh, micronutrition. You know, we even have a hypnotherapist, uh, acupuncture. We have it all, all designed to help people have a baby. IVF well, is just an important part of the treatment uh, a journey, but that is not the journey. So I think that brings us to your uh, your clinic, Zeta West Clinic. I think there are a lot of things are said about Zeta West Clinic, their huge phenomenal success rate. So what is it the different that you are doing at Zeta West that is giving us such a phenomenal success rate and so can you uh, share uh, more about uh, your clinic and your approach to the patient? I'll do that. You know, the background is this. Uh, I, I think you know Caroline Coulomb, uh, the late, he died on, in October, uh, mm-hmm. yes. very clever woman. I mean, her brain sharp as razor, you know. So when I used to go to Chicago, um, I spent a week with her, a week with the um, President Franklin University. And then we went out one day. She had this lab, about four doctors feeding into it. I uh, went out with the scientific director. We're there yes. having yes. lunch. And then uh, he said, um, you know, she asked her, he asked Karen Kulam, what's this doctor doing or that's not doing? Like, why do you ask? So said, because... Stay in the lab, looking at the microscope, the quality of eggs from her, his patients, the quality of embryos, and their subsequently pregnancy rates were so much higher than everybody else. What is he, what is he doing others are not doing? That he was the one that did holistic approach. 
So they will, they're so, they call it micronutrition, where they prepare a couple before they have IVF, the man and the woman, so we can optimize egg quality, sperm quality. If you optimize them, you have optimized embryo quality, optimized chances of having a successful pregnancy. So I thought, my goodness, if somebody can remotely see the difference, I said, I don't want to care about randomized control study here. If somebody can remotely see this, then there is something in it. So when I came back and I met up with Zita, we'll be, you know, we said, okay, uh, we'll be talking about holistic approach. Say, look, I told Zita, now let's do it. Uh, just to show, to, right, to prove to us, to myself, will this actually improve outcome as well with us in the UK? Oh my God, phenomenally, in the first three months, small clinic starting, doesn't happen very often. She, we shut up to the top two in the country. We you know my friend who has one of the best results, actually, in that first three months, we had better results than he did. So, you know, when we do the holistic approach, in my clinic, you know, nobody starts IVF without that preparation. And it was so important to us that we made it free of charge to the, the uh, consultation with the nutritionist uh, to start preparing people were free of charge. We thought, we thought, no, if that's important, everybody should have access to it. So we made it free of charge and people accessed it. And you could see the difference. People I treated before in Nottingham, they came to London, brilliant looking embryos, very high success rates. So I was convinced. So, and then we got people together who believe that. My, my colleague, uh, Azita West, believed that as well. Uh, we have Anita, we have Terry. These are people who actually believe in it. You know, we're not just trying to copy what people are doing. I 100% believe that helps uh, people. So, but, and, and that's also the micronutrition. Some people need, it's about body, mind, spirit. Everything has to be in harmony. So there are people who benefit tremendously by seeing our, our, uh, our um, hypnotherapist. It, it all she does is empowers them to be able to manage the like, huge psychological issues. You know, I had a lady who came to see me after 12 failed cycle in a very good clinic in London. She came to see me. I told her, well, I'm going to do all this immune stuff, you know, otherwise find somewhere else to go. We did all that. Treated her. When I was drawing out the protocol, she said, oh, it, will never, it won't work again. I understand that. If you've had 12 failed cycles, you lose, you know, just like, I said, no. But you're about to have treatment. You tell me it won't work. It doesn't work like that. So she went to the city hypnotherapist, had sessions with her, helped her tremendously mentally, you know, did a micronutrition and everything. Because she had 12 failed cycles, we put two embryos back and up with twins. Then she wrote this beautiful letter and said, look, Dr. George, we should not only make nutrition compulsory, we should also make seeing the hypnotherapist compulsory because that helped her tremendously. So some people benefit a lot from acupuncture. Some people benefit from that. But, you know, there are so many things. It's just that you can have all that under one roof. So you can prepare people, people access the bits that they need. Because it's a lot of, about outcome. I believe I'm a stickler for results. You know, I want people to have babies. And therefore, whatever we need to do, to improve the chances, we will do it. So, um, so that's what has made you the. That's what has made you an expert in the management of patients who have recurrent IVF failures. I think, and I think even HFEA results are also shown. Record has also shown that I think Zeta West tops the uh, list, uh, especially I think for women under thirty-five for fresh transfers. I think you are the best. Uh, so highest success rate per embryo transferred. If I am uh, uh, wrong, please correct me. I think so. That's uh, really uh, yeah. Well, when we did the the um, 
uh, we normally obviously do your audits, but we, we, we like, we just don't do our audits. We also like it as somebody outside to do it so that, you know, to validate it for us because we don't want people to think we are the ones, you know, somebody came validated for the embryology, uh, head of embryology, um, validated it independently and gave us, our, we know, our result was almost twice the national average. Uh, and, uh, and that's a lot of hard work. Um, and, and, and you cannot, people cannot keep saying, you know, if I, you know, I mean, there's a big teaching hospital I had a lady, nine failed cycles, went for the review. They're going to do the same thing again. She said, no, 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 no. But you're not changing it. It hasn't worked nine times. She came to see me. We did investigations. She did that. She got pregnant straight away. She had three children now. So when we had these debates um, and they criticized, oh, you know, there's no evidence, blah, blah, blah. I said, no. The people, people should be criticizing is that clinic, that teaching hospital, my friend is the, is, the, is the medical director, who is giving people treatment that's not working, not asking why is it not working, and these women are paying for the treatment. It's not even free of charge. Even if it was free of charge, psychologically failing all the time, that is the real, these are the people people should be complaining about. People who are happy to take people's money and give them a IVF cycle that is simply not working, and they keep doing it over and over again. No. So, you know, you must ask questions. You must ask questions. I had a debate with the HF in the HFE last November about this, and I said, look, you know, it's not about reproductive immunology. I said, oh, where's the evidence? I said, look, the papers they are showing me that, that those papers are not even worth the paper they're written on because they think IVF failure, miscarriages, is just one thing. So, yes, they, you know, my friend would say, okay, give everybody a uh, click, uh, low, low dose aspirin and uh, low molecular weight heparin. They keep giving it and they're still miscarrying, nothing is, nothing is happening, you know, and they keep doing the same thing and the same thing over and over again. You can do that. You have to find out why, what the reason is. There's so many different reasons why it's not working. It may not work. An example is this. Somebody comes to my clinic, has a temperature. I said, okay, maybe it's malaria. I give anti-malarials. And she gets better straight away. Next week, somebody else comes with fever. He said, oh, anti-malarials. I did, somebody like last week had anti-malarials and got better. Okay, anti, anti, anti-malarials. <laughs> Meanwhile, he has bacterial meningitis. They, they'll die because you're not treated. Just because they have fever doesn't mean they have <laughs> malaria. Just because you're miscarrying doesn't mean it's one thing or the other. So you must ask, why are you miscarrying? Find out the reason. You treat the reason why it's happening or the reason why they have an IVF failures, then you have a good outcome. So some of, some of the papers I was shown, they just say, okay, people, uh, misca- if you have a rec- recurrent miscarriage three times, some people r- randomize them, some people have uh, IVIG, some don't. And I don't know what they expect to see. That study there and then has failed because why giving people IVIG you don't even know whether they have immune problem or not, you know. So unless they have immune problem, why would IVIG help? And then my friend in California, um, uh, uh, what's his name now? He, he did a very clever study in his clinic. He now randomized people to IVIG, no IVIG, and showed there's no difference in outcome. Then. He investigated them, and the people that had immune problems then randomized them because they have an immune problem. They randomized them to IVIG or no IVIG, and the pregnancy rate was at least eight times (laughs) higher in people who had IVIG because these are people getting the treatment they deserve. 
a treatment will only work if it's actually treating somebody something that it can treat. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. So whenever any study, if you pick up any study and they just do it random, you know, without finding out whether people have a problem or not, you won't have it. Why would you, have a, why, why would you see a difference? Because you're treating so many people that don't need the treatment at all. So, you know, you know, I told the HFEA that, you know, what, what they should be saying is that people can have immunomodulation but they must have a reason to have immune modulation. Not just at random, you know, you must have a reason to do it. it that's the only time you can have a difference in outcome. I showed them three randomized control studies. What they did was they actually selected women with recurrent IVF failures who had elevated natural killer cell activity and then randomized them and each of them showed significantly higher live birth rate in the in the in the in the people who were who were treated that's the only time you can you can you can tell that if you don't do that i pick up if you haven't done that i won't read the paper at all because if if, if you said to me to 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 to, to um comment on for publication i just send it back because that paper, that research fails from the, from, the, from the first hurdle, you know. And sometimes some good professors are churning out such useless papers. I mean, it is simply for that, at that moment, <laughs> that paper is simply not worth reading. Nobody should even mention it to anyone because it has, you know, it has failed dramatically, drastically at the first hurdle. You can't design a research that won't answer the questions, you know. Otherwise, all the effort is wasted. So it's it's. Um, so you feel the diagnosis is absolutely, you know. Uh, so you feel the diagnosis is very important. Absolutely, that's what I remember. It was uh, Caroline Coulomb when he uh, she, she came. Um, I used to do every year. Uh, um, uh, um, our uh, reproductive immunology masterclass in London. We did one in Germany. I want to have slides, which I, I, I still use, was, you know, she said, does immunomodulation, can it help recurrent miscarriages or recurrent IVF failures? That's first slide. Second slide, no. Third slide, only if it is actually treating, you know, only if, if you've done it, investigations to show that it can do it. So, you know, and you, then she says, testing, 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 testing. You gotta find out what's happening. What's, you know, that's medical practice is simply that. If you have a, if you have a headache, you have to find out why you have a headache. Do you have meningitis? Do you have malaria? Do you have... You can't... Uh... Next thing which we would like to know about you is your experience with intralipids. I think there was a, a big uh, story about it and uh, about the mayonnaise babies and... Uh... <laughs> yes, very interesting. It was, um, you know, it went... Uh, Caroline Coulomb and her research fellows did all the work on intralipids. I mean, we had been looking for a different way of treating immune uh, immunomodulation, purely because IVIG was extremely expensive. It was blood products and people just felt uncomfortable with it. Uh, so we thought if, if we could have an alternative, that would be great. Then I think it was Professor Clark in Canada mentioned quite a while ago that uh, interlipids um, treated, you call it the danger signals or in pregnancy. And you were talking, referring to what causes miscarriages. And then he published it on it, said it, it helped, but nobody went back to it. And then until Karen Kulam then his and her uh, research fellow showed 
that they're they looking at nitrate killer cell uh, assay, that uh, intralipid could reduce nitrate killer cell activity as well, just as they were as good as IVIG. Their efficacy was the same. Then I said, okay, it may be the same, but you know, if I have to give intralipid every, every week, then it defeats the purpose because it's an infusion. But then, then they, they compared it to as a third thing called soluble uh, HLAG. These are things that are known to, to immunomodulate. And they found that they were all equipotent. And then the duration of, of IVIG was about four weeks, three to four weeks. Intralipid was actually six to nine weeks. So it's even better. And then, of course, safety profile. Alan Beer told me three things you have to meet would be one, it has to be equipotent. It has to be, it cannot be less effective. Two, it can be cheaper. Three, it must be safer. So he said, if you meet these three criteria, there's no reason why it shouldn't change. So when they met all the criteria, it was cheaper, it was just, unless you're allergic to egg or soya, then that's okay for you. It was equipotent, even last like a bit longer than IVIG. I thought, well, I'm, uh, you know, there's no reason why we shouldn't do it. So when I got back to Nottingham, I said, okay, but would this work in Nottingham? So I did it all over again and showed pregnancy rates much, much, much higher um, uh, with intralipid compared to the one I did with IVIG. So they were, I, I confirmed they were repotent. So I called my colleagues and told them, look, you know, we cannot justify IVIG anymore unless somebody's allergic to egg or soya. So we started using intralipid infusions. Did some, the work I did showed clearly that it was equivalent to IVIG. So when I moved to, not to, to London, of course, I carried on doing it. And, um, you know, when we came, there were a lot of women miscarried, you know, well, mainly have your failures, a few miscarriages. Um, and it worked really, really well. So... Uh, my colleague, Zita West, you know, I think it was, I don't know, it was our first year anniversary. Uh, I think uh, Daily Mail wanted to interview some of our patients because they've had about this fantastic treatment. Um, so simple. So it was pop. They interviewed people. They wrote about it. You know, the simplicity of it. And then um, there's a picture in my clinic that she, uh, oh, the women with their babies. They calculated how many failed cycles, I think about six of them had had. It was almost like something like 100, something like that. And I had babies. So in that early male, because it was, uh, um, it had soya oil and, uh, and, uh, and, uh, and, and, and egg proteins, called it mayonnaise. So the big thing, they said mayonnaise babies. And I've never lived that down because, you know, every, everywhere I go, they, they, people want to pull my legs. They may ask me about mayonnaise. Maybe I would have mayonnaise with, with, this, uh, with, with this meal or not. But um, it's, it's um, so it, it's the simplicity of it uh, that right. won't. Right. But, but there are women who simply uh, need something different. You know, LIT, for instance. Um, I used to do it a lot when I was in Nottingham, but you know the politics in the UK made it actually very difficult. And uh, but uh, you know there is somebody who still does it, and um, you know there are it simply it does work. We had an embryologist when I was in Nottingham who had about how many four or five miscarriages. When you're working with somebody, you don't want to. It's private matter. She told me every time, but I didn't know how to say, look, why don't we investigate and treat you? Because I felt I might step in overstepping my boundaries. So after the fourth one, I, I called her to her, look, I'm sorry. I'm going to intervene now. You can tell me to shut up at any stage. I won't shut up anyway. I said, be saying what I'm saying. So she agreed. We, we checked them. I think we, did, we checked HLADQ Alpha. Anyway, she was exactly the same match as her husband. Uh, LAD test negative. 
So I thought, well, this is what we're going to do. And the rest, and this is an umbrella, just very quiet girl. Then she now had, she had two babies. And then, of course, the news picked it up. It was on BBC. She was interviewed by Women's Own magazine everywhere. And for this woman, who usually very quiet, to come out in public domain and be standing in a television studio, television studio saying what she was saying, of how much it meant to her. So, you know, somebody then tells me it may not work. I'm sorry. Can't talk to her. Can't tell her that. <laughs> you know. And um, so there are women, even with IVF, who are using trilipis, still not getting anywhere with them. And then I send them for lit. And they get some successful treatment and have pregnancies. So, you know, there are a lot of things we have at our disposal which we can use to help women with current failures and also, as you do, with very current miscarriages as well. Uh, it's a matter of you seeing your patients, determining, okay, for this patient, this is where I'm going to do it, and, 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 uh, and help them. You guys are doing incredibly good job job in India. Yeah, thank you. I think we have similar experience with patients who have uh, failures and miscarriages and uh, they have been doing extremely well uh, yeah. uh, with LIT. You have to get IVF people in India to, to really come and see what, how they can help their patients because um, India is a huge place. And uh, there is definitely a place most IVF cycles fail. And finding why they're failing and correcting and treating them uh, is very important and can help a lot of people. And that's why the job both of you are doing is just incredible. I mean, there, there'll be challenges, of course, but you know, you know what you're doing, you believe, and it's, you, you sure it helps because we'll have the babies, and, um, and and that's what matters, you know, of, of, of what you're doing, and also the outcome you're getting. Those two things, uh, um, um, it, it's uh, it's uh, so it, it's it, it, people cannot tell you that what you're doing, it, you know, question it, because people are having their babies. So finally, you feel reparative immunology has a, a big role to play in future in these management of these uh, reparative failure patients? Absolutely. Absolutely. Look, you know, the only time in the human body something foreign comes into your body and you don't reject it, it's in pregnancy. Right. So, so there's a unique immune tolerance that allows the woman to keep the baby for nine months against the design of the system. If anything goes wrong with this process of immune tolerance, whatever it is, then it can affect the outcome. It's simple logic. I don't know why we still argue about it, you know, because that is simple. It's as simple as that. You know, there's a process Something goes wrong with the process, affects outcome, very basic schoolboy logic, if you ask me. So, immunology, immunology has huge, huge parts to play. And it's a shame that a lot of women, couples that might need help, may not be getting the help because of the constant bickering and debate we have in this field. And, and, and it's a shame, you know. Uh, you know, you do what you're doing, I do what I'm doing. Our obligation is to our patients who are having, who are having her babies. The debates can go on forever. I mean, why not? You know, I, I like a good debate. I like, well, should we all agree on anything in medicine? That helps us put, to stay on our toes, do more research, do more work, uh, to see whether there's better ways of doing anything. So that's quite healthy to have... Uh, different opinions, um, as long as it doesn't get personal, uh, and, and, and that's entirely, entirely fine. But, you know, the, the tragedy is that there are a lot of women who need your help, 
who may not be getting it because one, either they don't know about reproductive, reproductive immunology, or, you know, some doctors say, well, we don't believe in it, but they have their views. And that's, I respect their, their views com completely. The question they should be asking their doctor, uh, patients should be asking their doctors is, why am I having miscarriages? Despite what you're doing, I'm still having it. Why am I having failed IVF failures? Despite all the things you say you're doing, I'm still having IVF failures. You know, it's not people think, okay, it's a financial implication of failed IVF. That's fine. But the psychological uh, uh, price people are paying for it, I think it's bad. Sometimes I think it's even worse because it doesn't leave you. You're there, it's in your head all the time. Uh, you know, so it's not just about getting people should have their babies as soon as possible. So there's no point waiting to have five miscarriages. You know, everywhere they should still require miscarriage, three failed, three miscarriages. It took us about two years to convince the American society for reproductive medicine to reduce it to two. Why do you wait for a third one? Before I start investigating, <laughs> no, like, you know, why do you why do you, somebody has to have a third miscarriage before I tell them, okay, this is what was causing it? Same for IVF. If you can have a baby now, why do you want to keep it and have it next year, December? So, <laughs> what should do? We physicians have a, a job to do, and that is to do it's a lot of work on our side we and i do all the investigations all the treatments but you know if that can help people have babies sooner it saves them money it saves them mental anguish so my ethos is not just having babies having them as soon as you can have them that's great that's uh, i think uh doc Dr. Josh, you have been doing great work in this field and uh, just uh, digressing from this point is because of your work, even you have been honored by the Nigeria, Nigeria as the top, uh, among the top 60 in last 60 years. So can you tell me about this special honor that you have got uh, from the Nigerian government? That was a complete surprise to me. I had no clue. I just got a letter asking me, you know, to write a, you know, to give them an idea, my a biopic. I said, "What for?" I said, "Well, there are a few things that they're considering. That they're, they're doing this, and um, you know." I said, "Okay." I mean, I have no, you know, there are a lot of eminent scientists, doctors entrepreneurs in Nigeria, loads and loads of them. How I managed to get to that list, I have no clue whatsoever. But, you know, you and I, we do what we do, not because we're, we want plaudits. We're just doing them because we want to help our patients. That's why we do them. So, you know, it was quite some of the people on that list are uh, people I hold in the highest, absolutely highest regards. And um, to stand with them in that, I, I just, it was, I felt so flattered and, you know, I, it was a big shock. I couldn't, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, but, you know, we have to keep doing what we're doing. And what mo our motivation is purely to help our patients, women who have miscarriages, People, women who have failed IVF cycle, yeah, they have babies. It's as simple as that. That's the basic thing you and I, you know, we, we are doing. And we mustn't take our eyes off that. That is what it is. Anything we get, in a, you know, any any plaudits we get along the way. For me, you know, it doesn't matter. As long as my patients are having babies, then everything else is secondary. It's a great thing to be honored as a person who has... Uh, uh, who made uh, people's lives matter. I think uh, to be specific, 60 Nigerians in 60 years making Nigerian lives matter. It's a great honor and I think we must congratulate you again uh, for that. Thank you, Thank you very uh, much. Indeed. And uh, 
I would like to ask you what message would you like to give our audience? Uh, our audience would be doctors and patients. So, uh, very we, straightforward. Uh, yeah, well, it's quite simple to me. For doctors, you know, please ask yourself why are my patients having recurrent miscarriages? Why do they keep having miscarriages? You're trying to do your best to the miscarrying. IVF, why are the people having IVFs that keep failing? You have this lovely embryo. Sometimes you screen them, they're normal embryos, and still they're not getting pregnant. You must ask questions. Please don't keep doing the same thing over and over again hoping that one day it will work. It may do, but ask questions. Why is it uh, not working? If you can ask those questions and get the answers, then you have a more focused treatment that can help the patient in front of you to achieve their goal of having a successful pregnancy. And for the patients, if your doctor keeps telling you uh, it's chance, uh, don't worry, maybe the next time, Say no. Tell them that you want to know why it's not working. Is it possible to know? If they are not able to, to, to investigate, they, could, they should send them to, to Dr. Raut, you know, uh, the, the, the wonderful couple the, who can investigate just to help them, to advise them. This is what you can add to the treatment to, 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 to have a successful outcome. So patients, don't take no for an answer. If your doctors press them to investigate and see if they can find out why you're not getting pregnant, why you're miscarrying. Because if they can find out the real reason, then they can treat it. You can only treat something if you know what it is. You can't treat something when you don't know what it is. So that's the message is testing, 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 and appropriate treatment usually immunomodulation. Thank you very much. I think that's, uh, that summarizes everything. The importance of reproductive immunology, your uh, huge experience in the field and the way you are help people. I think we are really privileged to have you, you uh, have you here as a guest and we really had great discussion and it is really, it's, uh, useful for both our doctor friends as well as our patients. So thank you very much and hoping to see you soon, maybe in London to ha again have a, a one more, uh, uh, maybe dinner with you at your uh, favorite restaurant, which we had a couple of years back. And maybe in some of the okay. conferences, like we met in Manila in uh, the immunology conference, I still remember the uh, great time we had. So uh, again, thanks a lot. Thank you, Dr. George. Uh, uh, thank you so much for having me. And uh, I keep doing the fabulous work you're doing in India. Thank you very much.